Hi, this is the first video of my new series on electron paramagnetic resonance. This lecture is on the resonance phenomenon. Throughout the, the first lectures, I will assume that you have some basic uh, course of uh, quantum mechanics and introductory quantum mechanics course that you are familiar with Dirac notation and that you have a basic vector and matrix algebra uh, knowledge, including dot product, matrix eigenvalues, and eigenvectors. So, electrons have several properties, one of which is uh, charge, mass, and spin. So, the electron mass is 9.1 uh, times 10 to the power of minus 31 kilograms. Its electron charge is minus 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulomb and its spin is one half. Spin one half means that the electrons can have two projections of the spin value which is ms equals plus one half and ms equals minus one half. The plus one half is also designated sometimes as alpha and minus one half as beta and also with up and down arrows respectively. These are basically two possible spin states of the electron. Because the electron has charge and it has spin, it also has a, a magnetic moment. The magnetic moment of the electron is mu s, is a vector a quantity that's equal to minus the Bohr magneton, which is a, a ratio of several different a, constants, another constant factor called the geomagnetic ratio and the spin of the electron. This spin is an operator. We are going to see that many quantities in here in EPR that arise from quantum mechanics are operators. So the mu s magnetic moment is also an operator that acts on the spin of the electron. So, the Bohr magneton is the product of the electron charge times the reduced Planck's constant divided by two times the mass of the electron. And it has a value of 9.274 times 10 to the power of minus 24 joules over Tesla. Joules is a unit of energy and Tesla is a unit of magnetic field. The zero magnetic ratio is a dimensionless constant than it has classically a value of 2, but because of some uh, high-level uh, electrodynamic corrections, uh, deviates slightly from 2, and it has a value of 2.0023193, etc. It has several more uh, significant figures. So, because the spin of the electron can have two orientations, its magnetic moment also can have two orientations. So, the spin up state of the electron corresponds to a magnet that has its north pole to the uh, opposite direction, because the electron charge is negative. So, the, this gives rise to this negative sign in the magnetic moment of the electron. And the ms equal minus one half projection spin down would have a magnetic moment pointing up. So we are going to discuss a few things about uh, magnetic fields and magnetic moments. And for that, we need to see more or less how the magnetic field of different types of magnets uh, look like. So these curves that have an arrow that go out of the north pole of a magnet and into the south pole of a magnet are called magnetic field lines. Are uh, imaginary lines, they don't actually exist, that allows us to visualize the vector field that is the magnetic field. So this means that the magnetic field is normal to the uh, magnet just outside the magnetic poles, north and south and it goes outward of the North Pole and inward to the South Pole. If, for example, we put two similar magnets close together but not touching with their North and South Poles uh, parallel, 
we'll see that outside the two uh, magnets we have this curved magnetic field which is the similar to the typical magnetic field of a point dipole but on the inside we have a region in the middle where we have a close to uniform magnetic field and to the sides we have a slightly curved magnetic field that goes from the north pole of one magnet to the south pole of the other magnet. We can achieve a similar type of magnetic field by using electromagnets. For example, if we put a coil uh, that has a constant current going through it, this will generate a magnetic field. We are not going to go now uh, deeper into the induction laws, but suffice to say that one of these electromagnets will be a north pole and the other electromagnet would be a south pole and the magnetic field will go from the north to the south pole of the magnet and these coils will be wrapped around these polar pieces that are made of a magnetically conducting materials such as iron that basically force the magnetic field lines to go through the material instead of going through the air. This allows to concentrate the magnetic field lines and to have a stronger magnetic field between the polar pieces. If we make these polar pieces large enough and we put it close enough, we can have a very uniform magnetic field in between. And this is more or less what is used in most EPR spectrometers. So we need a quite uniform magnetic field in between because it is necessary to have the same magnetic field value and orientation in all points of our sample. So if the sample has a certain volume, we need that in all the volume of the sample, the magnetic field has the same value and direction. That's why we need to have a uniform magnetic field. So if we have electrons in the absence of any external magnetic field, both spin up and spin down, states have the same energy. These are called degenerate states. But if we uh, put an electron inside the external magnetic field, which we make uniform because it simplifies our analysis, then the spin up orientation of the electron, where the up direction is the same as the orientation of the external magnetic field, it will have a higher energy than the spin down orientation. So this is because the uh, magnetic moment of the electron opposes its spin direction because of the negative charge. So basically a small magnet will want to align its direction, its dipole moment with an external magnetic field. And this is why we get a separation of the spin up and spin down energy levels for an electron in a magnetic field. If we have, uh, uh, again, this magnetic moment of the electron mu s in an external magnetic field, its energy will be the scalar product of the mu s times the magnetic field vector with a minus sign. This comes from classical electrostatics and electrodynamics. So, if we have a uniform magnetic field, we can choose, in, to simplify our problem, we can choose the set direction to be the same of the magnetic field. And therefore, we can have a situation where the magnetic moment of the electron completely aligns with the external magnetic field. And then we will have this simplified equation which is valid under uh, certain conditions that the scalar product of mu s times b with a minus sign would be equal to uh, plus the Bohr magneton times the gyromagnetic ratio of the electron times the magnitude of the magnetic field times the spin projection of the electron which can be plus one half of minus one half. This equation shows us that the plus one half a spin projection will have a higher energy because of this positive sign here than the minus one half spin projection. And because the energy of the spin is proportional to the magnetic field B, 
we will have that the energy levels of the electron when we increase the magnitude of the magnetic field B, so note that these bold letters indicate vectors and these non-bold letters indicate the magnitude of a vector quantity. The energy levels will be linearly dependent on the magnetic field. We can cause transitions between these two possible states of the electron by uh, giving the electron energy through electromagnetic radiation of an appropriate frequency. We will see this uh, on a later slide. Before going there, I will go back to the idea of the uh, scalar product between the magnetic moment of the electron and the external magnetic field. This will give rise to a Hamiltonian, which is called the Seman Hamiltonian, which produces the energy levels of the electron spin on an external magnetic field. If we define an XYZ coordinate system, the magnetic field B will have components Bx, By and Bz in this coordinate system. If we carry out this uh, scalar product between the spin operator and the magnetic field, we will have that the Seman Hamiltonian is the S x component of the spin operator times bx plus sy times by plus sz times bz. So this is the expansion of the scalar product. These are spin operators which act on the spin variables plus one half and minus one half of the electron and we will see on later videos how to actually uh, carry out all these uh, operations in order to obtain an energy matrix. But for now, we are going to be able to simplify this problem because we can choose a coordinate system that coincides with the external magnetic field. So we define the z-axis of our coordinate system to be in the same direction of the applied magnetic field. So in this coordinate system, the magnetic field will have components 0 in x, 0 in y, and bz, or simply just the magnitude of B in the set direction. So in this case, components X and Y of the scalar product uh, vanish, and we only have the spin Z uh, operator times the magnetic field Z. So this is where some knowledge of quantum mechanics uh, is required, because we need to know that in quantum mechanics, different uh, dynamic magnitudes, one of which is the spin, operate on different states, giving the same states or sometimes other states multiplied by some number. If an operator acts on uh, one of its eigenstates, it will give a value that's called the eigenvalue times the same eigenstate. So the plus one half and minus one half spin projections or the spin up and spin down states of the electron are eigen states of the SZ spin operator which have eigenvalues plus one half and minus one half. There's another constant H bar in here but I will disregard it for now. The constants like mu b and g e and the magnetic field b are also operators, but their effect is simply to multiply any state by their value. So basically, all electronic states are eigen states of uh, a numeric constant. If we go a little bit further, we know that the energy of a state n, if that state n is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian of the system, can be obtained by uh, generating a bracket, this is direct notation, of the Hamiltonian h sandwiched, let's say, between the n states. So, in our simplified Seman Hamiltonian for a spin one half, we have two possible states, plus one half and minus one half. So in this case, we can calculate the energy of both states and 
we simply sandwich the Seman Hamiltonian, which is mu b times g e times b times s z operator between either plus one half and plus one half or minus one half and minus one half. We don't have any uh, non-vanishing of diagonal elements in here. So if we carry out these operations, we see that when the s z operator acts on plus one half, we obtain the value plus one half times the same eigenstate. And then we can take out this plus one half eigenvalue outside of the bracket. And by the orthonormality of the different spin states of an electron, we have that the bracket of plus one half and plus one half is equal to one. And then this means that the expectation value of the SZ operator between the state plus one half is equal to plus one half. The same we have for the state with spin minus one half. We can carry out the, the operation and we see that the minus one half minus one half bracket is also equal to one and the expectation value then it is minus one half. If we carry these expectation values inside the whole expression for the Seman Hamiltonian, we have two energy levels, one for plus one half and the other for minus one half, that in the, each case is plus one half times the Bohr magneton times the gyromagnetic ratio times the magnetic field and minus one half times the Bohr magneton times the gyromagnetic ratio times the magnetic field. The energy difference between those levels, which is the same linear dependency that we have seen before, is equal to mu b times g times b. In order to generate transitions between these two energy levels, we have to apply energy in the form of uh, an electromagnetic radiation uh, quantum, which is h nu, h being the Planck's constant and nu being the frequency of the uh, electromagnetic radiation. This will induce a transition between the minus one half and plus one half states. And if we equate h nu to the delta energy, we'll have that h nu is equal to mu b times g e times b. Out of this, we can take the g value, and I have taken out the uh, subindex e, and the g value for this transition can be calculated from the ratio of the h times nu divided by the Bohr magneton times b0, where b0 we is just b at the magnetic field value where we see a transition. So, in EPR, continuous wave EPR is usually performed by sweeping the magnetic field value because this is easy to do by changing the current in the electromagnet and uh, staying at a constant frequency. So when we sweep the magnetic field, when we reach the energy separation between the spin states that matches exactly the radiation a frequency or radiation energy, we will have an absorption of energy in our system. Our sample will absorb energy and we will see this as an absorption. In further videos, I will go more into detail on both the workings of an EPR spectrometer, how the signal is obtained and also on the details of the spin Hamiltonian and how different quantities are calculated. And we will also see in future videos hyperfine uh, structure, the effect of the interaction with uh, different nuclei, that is. We will also see an isotropy of the G value and we will see many other spin-spin interactions which make EPR a very interesting and useful technique in material science, in organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry, catalysis and many other topics. So I hope that you have found this video useful. Thank you very much.